Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. In the prior episode on my HF transmitter project, I talked about the antenna module and I talked a little bit about the low pass filter. Well, today's episode is more details about that low pass filter, including some performance measurements of it. So let's dive in. An RF power amplifier, like this IRF510 design I'm building for this project, will always have some undesired frequency components in its output. Some of those components will be spurious signals that came in along with the input signal and got amplified further, and some will be generated by the power amplifier itself as modulation or nonlinearity artifacts. Letting those undesired components continue unabated out to the antenna could result in me causing interference on other frequencies, or possibly even making illegal out-of-band transmissions. Fortunately, there's a common and highly effective solution. Put a filter between the power amp and the antenna. Now, a filter is not going to completely eliminate those components. The goal is to attenuate them below any level of concern. Fortunately, the only components we expect to see at this stage are above the fundamental emission frequency, mostly second order or higher harmonics of the fundamental frequency, or remaining intermodulation products. That makes the filter design a bit easier, meaning all we need is a good low pass filter. But what constitutes good in this case? For starters, we desire zero losses at our intended frequency. Earlier in the block diagram, we could tolerate a couple of dB of insertion loss in our filters because we had amplifiers after any filtering. But here, we're all done amplifying, and we want to put every precious watt of our fundamental frequency on the air. Even a single dB of loss takes away about 20% of our transmitted power, so we really want that insertion loss to be in fractions of a dB. The next criteria we desire is aggressive attenuation above our transmitted frequency. Okay, so how much attenuation do we need? Here in the United States, there are several FCC criteria that apply to amateur radio emissions, in particular Part 97.307 of Title 47. That section states several elements of good practice, but of specific interest is Paragraph E, which in its strictest requirement states that any spurious emissions must be at least 43 dB below the mean power of the fundamental emission. So for example, if my transmitter were putting out 45 dBm, or 30 watts at the fundamental frequency, no other frequency components it put out could exceed 2 dBm, or 1.6 milliwatts. Fortunately, I'm traveling over well-trodden ground here. There is plenty of good published info on low-pass filter design, especially for those used on amateur radio frequencies. Once again, my go-to source is the EMRFD book, which has a nice section in Chapter 3 on low-pass filters. Of particular interest to me are those described as ultra-spherical. These have more aggressive attenuation skirts than a traditional Chevy Chev or a Butterworth design, but they do have more ripple losses in the passband. That ripple tends not to affect the relatively narrow transmission bandwidth as long as the filter is configured properly. Choosing target component values is very easy. Just plug and chug using standard table values and the formulas for the order of filter you want. In my case, I've chosen a fifth order ultraspherical, and I'll play around between narrow, mid, and wide versions to get the desired performance on each band. I'll use three shunt caps and two series inductors. I've put together this LT Spice simulation of a fifth order medium spherical filter for the 40 meter band. Here's that pass band ripple that I mentioned, but look, from 7 MHz to 7.3 MHz, the insertion losses hit a local minima, less than a dB, so that's acceptable for 40 meter use. Looking at higher frequencies, the skirt is really steep. For example, the predicted attenuation at the second harmonic of 14 MHz is 47 dB. For comparison, I've overlaid these results with equivalent 5th order Butterworth and Chevy Chev filters. You can really see just how much better the ultraspherical design performs with the same total number of elements. Now there's an important caveat here. These results are using target values for the caps and inductors. Actual real world values, along with component tolerance and drift over temperature, will have an impact, possibly even shifting that local minima outside the 40 meter band and causing the insertion losses to increase. So I might need to do some fine tuning of the caps and inductors to keep that local minima in band. So how do I know that 47 dB of attenuation at the second harmonic is going to be enough? How about attenuation at higher frequencies? 
Well, I don't really know. In fact, I kind of did this project backwards, meaning I probably should finish the RF power amplifier first, then measure its performance, and then figure out what kind of filter I need. But what would be the fun in following logic? Seriously though, in most of these HF transmitter applications, a fifth order filter is usually enough, but I did leave enough length in that design that I can go to a seventh order and fit in additional components if needed. I briefly touched on the physical layout of the filter back in the episode about the antenna module, so let's take a closer look at it now. For the three shunt capacitors, I'm planning on using leaded parts, mostly because I have a big variety of those. I've also laid out space for putting two in parallel in each of the three positions. And I've included extra hole patterns that can accommodate four different lead spacings. That lets me more easily mix and match pairs to get as close as possible to the target capacitance. I'm also using standard 2.54 mm pitch pin headers and sockets for the interconnects. I did investigate using other connectors, but I think these will work fine, especially since I tripled up the pins to share the load. One end uses six pins and the other five, and one side is blue in color and the other is black. This provides some physical and visual polarity as the filter construction is not reversible. Now, unlike the upstream bandpass filter, there's no feature on it to tell the Arduino that the correct filter has been inserted for the band of interest. And if I get it wrong, say by trying to transmit on 20 meters when I've got the 40 meter filter installed, I'm likely to blow the FETs in the final amplifier. So I'm going to have to be careful. I also need to give some consideration to the voltage rating of the shunt capacitors and to the ampere capacity of the series inductors. My nominal 30 watt RMS RF signal will hit a peak voltage of 55 volts, so I'm choosing caps with at least a 100 volt rating. And in fact, many of these leaded caps have voltage ratings much higher than that. The inductors are a bit trickier, meaning I have both the saturation of the cores to consider, as well as resistive losses in the wire itself. Here I basically just punted on those concerns, and just stuck with the core sizes and wire gauges shown in the various tables. I'm going to measure the 40 meter filter, and to do that, I've got this little setup right here. Of course, I've got the antenna module. I've got my little nano VNA, and I apologize, you can't see the screen because no matter how I position on the workbench, all you see is the overhead light reflected on it. So I'm going to change the camera view here in a minute so we can see this more clearly, but just wanted to lay it all out here. Uh, I have calibrated it, of course, using the two little cables that came with it, and the short, the open, the through, etc., etc. So it's all set for or the one megahertz to 30 megahertz spam. And the two measurements I'm gonna take here, uh, I've got this first board here. This is just a short, there is no filtering here. So I can see what the effect of all of the setup and the board is before I put the filter in. And then of course I got right here, here's the 40 meter filter. I'll plug it in and take a look at it. And we'll take um, a comparison then to the LT Spice simulation and see just how close I came to it. Okay, I've zoomed in on the Nano and we can see more closely what's happening now. And on the antenna module, I've got that shorting board put in place, meaning there's no filter. It's just connecting input to output. And this looks acceptable. On the S21 parameter, there's barely a quarter of a dB loss from 1 megahertz uh, to 30 megahertz. So that's pretty good. I can live with that, I think. Now what I'm going to do next, I'm going to swap in the 40 meter filter and let's have a look at that response. So unplug this guy and then plug in the filter and bump the camera. Sorry about that. All right. So on the screen, we can see several things of interest. I'm going to start here by putting the marker right around uh, seven megahertz. And I will zoom in on that here in a moment, but that's where that local minima is that I mentioned in the LT spice simulation. So that's good. We can see the attenuation taking off quickly above that. And if I take it out to about 14 megahertz, Right around there, it's at minus 60 dB. So that's even better than what the model predicted. But then we got this weird behavior. You know, why isn't this continuing all the way down? Well, um, my simplistic understanding of what's happening here is there's always self resonance in your components, and your uh, inductors are going to have a point where they uh, get a self resonant, and then the 
uh, inner capacitance between the turns are going to start to denominate, and kind of vice versa with capacitors. The the leads on your caps is, and again, these are leaded caps. The leads on the uh, the traces on the board are all going to have some inductance. So that those effects are starting. I think that's what's happening here. Now, you guys that are experts in your Laplace transforms and your poles and zeros are probably tearing at your hair, saying, "No, that's way too simplistic." But the point is, it's not following the model. But in the way that it's uh, actually behaving is not detrimental. There's still a lot of attenuation out here. It's not going all the way, you know, very close back up to the to, to zero attenuation. So I think I can live with that. So let me do this next. I'm going to change the parameters on the uh, nano so we can look more closely at the, um, the 40 meter band. And to do that, bear with me. Here. Okay, let me change the setting here. I'll go to a center of 7 megahertz. And I'll change the span to say three megahertz. And we'll look at this here briefly. So at seven megahertz, I've got about just under a dB of loss. And then at the other end of the band, 7.3, I got 0.56 dB of loss. So that's right at the limit of what I was looking for. I was looking for no more than about a dB of loss, I would prefer it to be less. Now, a couple factors. I just don't know how accurate the nano is going to be at sub dB losses. But nonetheless, it's kind of telling me that that local minima, I could probably shift it a little bit uh, to the left if I want to fine tune the values on the filter. But I think for now, I'm just going to leave it as it is, build up the rest of the power amp and finish the rig and see how it works. So it looks like this little guy is likely to work just fine. What's next on this project? Well, I'm actually juggling three things at once here. In addition to working on the low pass filter, I did finish, populate, and test the two versions of the RF preamp board, the IRF5, IRF 510 rather, and the 2N5109 versions. I'm almost done with that episode, and that'll be out shortly to show how they compare to each other. And I have started cutting metal on the case to start stuffing it with all these parts and start getting down to wrapping up this project. So look for those two episodes to follow shortly. As always, I do thank you very much for watching my channel and I hope you're enjoying this series. Leave some comments or questions below if you're curious about some of the other design decisions and trade-offs I've had to make on this project. And until next time, bye for now.